when I was growing up in a small town of about 700 people, my exposure to art and illustration and painting was pretty limited, obviously. And one of the things that I did have access to were comics and things like Mad Magazine and Cracked Magazine. And I used to read those religiously. I used to trade them with my friends. We'd uh, get together and decide, okay, who's going to buy what comic this month? And then we could trade uh, at school or during the summer or on the weekends or whatever. So uh, we, had this, uh, we had our own little system of uh, making sure that we could all have access to whatever that we wanted to look at and to read. And, of course, uh, Mad Magazine at the time was all black and white, and they had great artists in there like Jack Davis and Paul Coker. Cracked Magazine had John Severin. He used to do a lot of the covers and a lot of the satirical uh, movie and, and uh, play takeoffs and the literature takeoffs. And it was all black and white. Uh, the covers were color, but the interior was all black and white, which is fine to me. Uh, on the rare occasion that Vampirella magazine would come out, my favorite artist uh, doing Vampirella at the time was a guy by the name of Jose Gonzalez, and I loved what he did with the black and white. And of course, again, that was a totally black and white magazine. The covers had color on them. Uh, Frank Frazetta used to do some of the covers. And I was just so intrigued by the power of black and white and the different effects that they could get uh, with the black and white. Now the color in the comic books like Weird War and Eerie, Creepy, Sergeant Rock, uh, everything from Archie and Jughead and Betty and Veronica to uh, other things like um, the Classics Illustrated magazine, which was actually a comic book format for classic literature. And whoever thought of that idea, I think, was very smart because they tricked a lot of young people like myself into reading classic literature and in comic book form, which was really interesting. And later, I was intrigued enough and I had just enough of an idea about the story that I could go ahead and, and read the, the full-blown uh, literary works. So that was a pretty good trick back in the day to get uh, to get young people and students to read good literature. Now the comic books that I looked at were always in color and the classics illustrated were in color but I really didn't care because the color seemed a little garish to me. It was a little acrid. It was like pure colors of ink printed on really bad pulp paper to make them affordable of course. So the color wasn't all that intriguing to me because I guess I, I just suppose I didn't think it was that good or, or it wasn't uh, something that really captivated my attention. So I was constantly uh, looking at the black and white, paying much more attention to the black and white. And the other things that I used to do with the comics especially and the classics illustrated was I would, I would kind of play this game with myself. I would get the new magazine or the new comic and I would just go through it and I would try to uh, see if I could pick up on the story and the storyline by not reading the words but just looking at the story and um, that was just kind of a game that I did to entertain myself when I first got a new uh, comic or illustrated or classics illustrated but what I was really doing I think back uh, to the past when I was doing that what I was really doing was checking up on the storytelling abilities of the people that were actually writing and publishing these works. So I guess I was always aware of the narrative. I was always aware of the storytelling of pictures. And uh, like they say, if you can, uh, you can look at a lot of really great classic movies with the sound turned off and still get the story. And I think that's pretty important. So basically my world of illustration and sequential art, which is basically a comic book, was really uh, focused on the black and white values of how to make pictures work uh, compositionally and the excitement and Jose Gonzalez in Vampirella magazine could make fog and rain and snow and sleet and and uh, gloomy nights and exciting uh, scenes during broad daylight. Uh, he, he could do anything with pen and ink with just black and white line art and that was amazing to me and really intriguing and I appreciate it.
the illustrations that I did see that were in color, besides the comic work, were things that my mother and my grandmothers had around the house, like Ladies Home Journal and Red Book, because that was, I grew up in the time of, of the great magazine illustrators, or actually at the very end of the great uh, magazine illustrations, uh, and of course Mark English and Bernie Fuchs were the king of the ladies' magazines. Uh, illustrations in Red Book, Ladies Home Journal, there, there's a list of 20 um, that were really at the top of the game back then. So I did see color that was very sophisticated and it was printed on better paper, it was a coated paper so uh, they looked a lot better. And Boy's Life, I lived and breathed my month to get the new Boy's Life every month and they had great uh, stories and great illustrations and I remember Bart Forbes doing a lot of uh, illustration for Boy's Life and I know Mark English and Bernie Fuchs and and um, all of my heroes uh, worked for that magazine as well so I was seeing those things but I really wasn't picking up on how sophisticated they were but I did know that that color was a completely different color idea and color space than the comics that I was looking at. So it was two really different aspects of color. When I got out of college, started trying to make a living making pictures, doing illustration, I had a severe problem with color because I never really thought about it before. I didn't have teachers that explained it to me very well, or at all, really. So when I was doing paintings in college and directly after college, I had what seems like a, a thousand tubes of paint. And every time I would do a painting, I would put out different colors on my palette. So it was like I was starting fresh every single time. And I, I just didn't have a consistency of a color palette that was doing me any favors at all. I, there, I had too many choices. Um, I had no um, way of, of figuring out what colors that I should consistently be using, which colors were just crazy and I shouldn't even use them at all. Um, and every time I did a painting, it was starting fresh. And, and I knew right away that that was a bad idea. So I needed to find a consistent way to deliver a product to my clients. And I really kind of panicked about it. I thought, you know, I have to solve this problem. Uh, drawing is hard enough, composition is hard enough, storytelling is hard enough, trying to please the client is hard enough. The last thing I need to do is worry about color and color was one of the things that the clients would react to first and I think a lot of people react to color first because it's very emotional. It, it could be, it can be the most emotional part of an image whether it's a painting in a gallery or a museum or on the printed page. Um, color affects us um, a great deal from the very beginning. So I thought I have to simplify this problem and after a lot of experimentation with a lot of tubes of paint and a lot of just throwing up my hands and just almost being defeated, I thought you know what maybe if I went back in time instead of trying to move forward and just try bulldoze my way through all these different things maybe I should really think of it in the simplest terms I could so I started thinking about the fourth grade and in the fourth grade my teacher brought out a prism and she held this prism in the shaft of light coming through the window in our fourth grade classroom and she split this ray of white sunlight coming into our room into its component colors and those colors were the colors of the rainbow so if I'm a human living on planet earth in our universe and I have this eye and this brain and all that I can see and perceive is what's called the visible light spectrum that's it that's a finite idea there's a rainbow of seven colors Sunlight can be split into its component seven colors with a prism. It's as simple as that. I can't see x-rays. I can't see gamma rays. 
I can't see ultraviolet light. I can't see infrared light. All I have as a human is visible light. I'm done. I can see those seven wavelengths of color. That was where I really had a breakthrough to make things simple. So then I looked at a color wheel, really, really looked at a color wheel for the first time. And there were the primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. Okay, we all know that. And there were the secondary colors. Secondary colors come from combining any two of the primary colors. In other words, if you take the primary colors of yellow and blue, mix them together, you get green. Green is a secondary color. If you take red and blue, two primary colors, mix them together, you get purple. Another secondary color. The other secondary is orange. So now I'm looking at the color wheel and there's six colors on there. That's it. You can make variations on those colors, but there's only six colors. That was the other breakthrough. So if the visible light spectrum, our rainbow, remember making the rainbow with the prism, if the visible light spectrum has seven colors and a color wheel only has six, where's that mystery color? Where's that other wavelength? Well, as it turns out, you have to delve into a little bit more detail and you find that the seventh color is indigo, which is a wavelength in between blue and violet. And light is an additive mixture, which means if you're designing a theatrical show or a rock and roll light show or whatever, the more colored lights you shine in one place on one spot on the floor or on a person, then the whiter and the more pure it becomes. In, or, in other words, if you take red, green, and blue, which are the um, uh, primary colors of light, and remember our monitors on our computers are RGB, that's where it comes from, red, green, green, and blue. When you shine those wavelengths in one spot, it becomes white. Paint is the complete opposite of that. Light is an additive mixture, which means you add a lot more light to get white. Paint is called a subtractive mixture because you have to keep pulling pigment out. You have to erase or remove things to get to white. So paint is a subtractive mixture. And that works the other way too. If you take all the colors on your palette, mix them all together, then you end up with a neutral. You end up with a brown or a gray. So indigo really doesn't matter for us when we're mixing paint and using a color wheel because you just have the three primaries, three secondaries, done. Six colors that my eye and my brain in this universe as a human, that's all I have. So to get variations on color, there are four main points that you can do to analyze a color or to help you mix a color or help you decide what color you need in a painting in what place. And the first question is, what is the basic color? What's the chroma? What's the hue? In other words, is it a red apple or a green apple? Is it a blue shirt or a red shirt? What basic color family is it? And it can be any of those six colors we talked about. It's either orange or red, yellow, blue, green, or violet. That's all. That's all the colors in the world that we can see. So once you decide what color it is, let's say it's orange. We're painting something that's orange. Okay, now the next question you ask is value. What is the value of that color? Is it really dark? Is it really light? Is it somewhere in between? Is it more dark than it is light? Uh, would it be a dark gray if you uh, took the saturation out of it? Um, so that's the second question, is what value? How light or how dark is it? The third question is what is the intensity of that color? That's very simple. Let's say we're looking at this orange again, this orange object, whatever it is. Now, is that color that we're trying to mix and perceive, is that color really intense? Is it like a shocking day glow color? Or is it very subdued and very low key? Is it very muted? Is it just barely orange? So that would be the other end of the spectrum. How intense is that color? And the fourth question is, what temperature is the color? 
And this is where the great debate starts because 10 people can look at a color and they'll argue all day long on whether it's a warm or a cool version of that color. Now, basically, a warm color is red, yellow, and orange. That's the way we think of it. And cool colors are green, violet, and blue. Now, each one of those colors can have a warm and cool variation. You can have a blue that has a lot of warmth to it. If you take blue, if you take ultramarine blue and mix burnt sienna with it, you're going to warm that blue up and it starts taking the intensity out and it just it has warmth to it. You can add other things to ultramarine blue and you can make it colder. You can make it an icy cold, you know, deadly looking blue. So you can have all temperatures of any color. So let's go back and, and look at these four questions again. Number one, what basic color is it? Number two, What's the value of that color? How light or dark is it? Number three, what's the intensity? Is it really bright? Is it really dull? Is it somewhere in between? And number four, what is the temperature of the color? And of course, temperature and value and chroma and intensity, all of these things are all relative, which means it depends on what else is in the picture, what's it next to, what's it on top of, how much of that color there is compared to everything else. So it's all relative and it all changes. And I'm sure you've all uh, done that little experiment where you take a, a gray square of paper. If you put that gray little square of paper this big, if you put it on a white sheet of paper, that gray looks dark. It's darker than the light color. You take the exact same little square piece of paper, put it on a black sheet of paper, now it looks light. So everything is relative. Colors the same way. So I set out to find a palette that was simple enough to use that I could please my clients and I could get colorful paintings and I could do whatever I needed to do but I didn't have to think about it or worry about it and it just made sense and I could be consistent because to make a living I had to consistently deliver a product in my business so I couldn't take chances at doing uh, a, a good drawing and a good composition and a good narrative and everything works and then I would lay an egg on the color. I couldn't do that. I couldn't risk it. So after much experimentation and using this and this and this I decided obviously from the beginning I was going to use those primary colors because I thought all the colors come from the primaries. The reason they're called primary colors is because you cannot mix them. You have to start with that color of pigment. Red, you have to start with red pigment. You can't mix red paint. So I got red and blue and yellow, which I had a trillion colors in my paint box already, and I started mixing and matching them, trying to figure out the simplest way of making a palette. What I ended up with was ultramarine blue. I thought, okay, that's my all-purpose blue. I can get a lot of different places with that. It works well with the other colors that I chose. And cadmium yellow medium and the red I had to compromise. I couldn't find that fantastic all-purpose red, so I used two colors of red. A lizard crimson, which is a cool red, and cadmium red light, which is a warm red. So by keeping those separate on my palette and sometimes mixing them together one way or the other, that was my palette. Ultramarine blue, cadmium yellow medium, cadmium red light, and a lizard crimson plus white. I virtually did all of the paintings in my in the like the middle section of my illustration career for about 10 years. I was an illustrator for 23 years. So about that middle 10 years I basically used that exact palette for every painting with the addition of what I called a guest color because I noticed that from the beginning my paintings were uh, very uh, harmonious in color because <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. It was all the palettes doing. Every time I mixed a color, there was a little bit of most of the other colors or, or a couple of the other colors in all of my mixtures. So all of these colors that I was making were coming from the same place. So it looked harmonious because 
everything had a piece of something else in it. So that was the good part. The bad part was it started to get a little bit monotonous and I started to understand how to use that palette so well that it, uh, it kind of took the challenge out of it. So I would start adding a guest color which means I would use my four basic tubes of paint that we talked about plus white and then I would add another color like cerulean blue sometimes it was burnt sienna sometimes it was an additional red sometimes it was sap green other times it was cadmium orange so that gave me the variety and that little spice and that little bit of of mental gymnastics that I had to overcome each time to kind of do new and different intriguing things I also learned a lot about color theory and didn't even know it because this palette was teaching me color theory whether I knew it or not uh, when I had a really intense red and I'd say okay well I need to use the complement to gray this red down I needed to take the intensity now a little bit well I didn't have any green on my palette so I didn't have to think about it really uh, this is before I would add the sap green uh, and I would just take some of the blue and some of the yellow which makes green and I could make it a cool green by adding more blue I could make it a warm blue by adding or a warm green by adding more of the yellow so I was constantly learning the physics of color and the color theory and didn't even know it I didn't even need to know it I, this is upon reflection I was thinking back to all this so this very limited palette teaches you how to smartly use color and you don't even have to be aware of it it's just you don't have any choices you think okay uh, I don't like this color it needs to be more of something else great grab a color because you only have a, cult, a couple to choose from it's not like you have to search through your paint box and find a thousand of these magic colors that you think is going to solve the problem and it's really amazing and intriguing and when I have students try this limited palette they get a good painting the very first time. It's that simple. It's amazing. I have my limited palette colors uh, put out on my palette now and uh, I'll show you those. I have two batches of white actually. I like one batch of white that I use for mixing warm colors and I pull from this side when I'm using cool colors. You don't have to do that, but that's just something that I found kind of keeps things uh, a little bit cleaner, a little bit more organized. So I have the cadmium yellow medium, cadmium red light, a lizard crimson, and ultramarine blue. And I like to put them in this order because I have them pretty much in the order of their value. This is probably the lightest and this is probably the darkest. And the other thing that I like to have uh, when I paint is a scraper like this. Uh, it's just basically a uh, scraper that I got from a uh, hardware store for a couple of dollars and it has a retractable uh, single edge razor blade in it like this. And when I get done painting then I just I scrape my palette like that and it gets nice and clean so I like to have that around and the actual palette that I'm using I made from a uh, just a, a piece of glass and on the back is just a piece of wood just a board that I would paint on and I sandwiched between the glass on the top and the wood the board on the back I uh, just sandwiched in between a piece of gray paper and that paper I tried to find as neutral a value just a middle value gray and I didn't want it too warm and I didn't want it too cool so I tried to make it a really neutral value and temperature if you don't want to use a type of palette like this it's absolutely fine to use paper plates or disposable palettes that are white or gray or whatever it's totally up to you but this was kind of interesting for me to start with and to learn on because things that are light show up light on this gray surface and things that are darker or mid-tone uh, relate to this gray specifically the first thing I'd like to start with is showing you that when you are working with white you have to be aware of what 
the white really does because I'll show you that uh, I have this pile of alizarin crimson here and when you add white to a color yes you do lighten it but you can see as I keep adding more and more white to this alizarin crimson that you not only are lightening the color but you're taking the intensity of the color down in other words white can really dull your color and you're cooling your color because white is a very cool color I think of it like uh, like a, another blue almost so I think of it as chlorine bleach like if you've ever done laundry and you've spilled bleach on your favorite shirt or a pair of jeans you know what happens it just it uh, takes all the color away so that's okay that's a fine thing there's a lot of times when you need that to happen but you just have to be aware that it is going to happen so here we have this full intensity intensity value of a lizard crimson and as we make it lighter we're also making it less intense and we're making it cooler so let's try that with another color let me clean my brush here a little bit I'm just using some paint thinner to uh, clean my brush so let's try um, let's mix up uh, I'm just going to take um, I'll show you what I'm doing here. I'm just going to take some uh, ultramarine blue and go back to that alizarin crimson and we're just going to make a really really intense dark, a, a dark deep purple basically is, uh, is all this will be and let me get in here so you can see this a little bit better and I'm just going to start adding some white to this so you can see we're starting to lighten the color you can see that it's a purple now but you can also see how quickly the intensity goes down as we keep adding white just like with the the red and the pink over here so there's nothing wrong with that happening you just have to be aware that white takes the intensity out of color and it takes the temperature down it, it makes it cooler so uh, you just need to be aware of that when you're painting and there are other ways you can lighten colors by adding perhaps Naples yellow that would be uh, I use Naples yellow sometimes uh, as my guest color when I know I'm going to be lightening a lot of colors but that's just an example uh, very quickly about what white will do to color so just be aware of that we talked a little bit about what white is and what white can do and what it does do now I want to talk to you about black and what I prefer to call it is dark because it's not necessary that it is black uh, there's nothing wrong with black paint there are wonderful amazing artists that use black paint let me give you a few John Singer Sargent Winslow Homer um, Mark English Chris Payne, Gary Kelly, all of those people use black and they use black very effectively and they use it correctly. I think a lot of students get in trouble because they use black ineffectually and they don't use it correctly. They don't use it well. So here I've mixed up what I call fake black. It's ultramarine blue and burnt umber. And you can see that it's it's dark and it's not necessary that it's black because I'm, I'm not concerned with something being devoid of color I just I just want this to be a dark neutral so what we can do now is I can make it a really cool dark by adding more of the ultramarine blue or I can do the same thing and make it warmer by just adding more burnt umber and the interesting part about making your own black is that when you add colors to it you're adding colors to something that's already a color so when you add colors to black um, not as interesting things begin to happen but when you add colors to a black that you mix yourself you're adding color to color because I'm using two 
beautiful colors to make this dark. I'm using burnt umber, which is an earth color, of course, and ultramarine blue. And when I start adding other colors to it, interesting things happen because I'm not starting with just a dead, dull black to begin with. I'm adding colors to colors. And I think that is the most important lesson to learn here is that when you make your own dark that it functions more as a color. Now you can see this beautiful array of neutrals that I have going and of course we can just keep adding more and more and more. We can throw some white in there to see what that will do. Um, but you might say okay well that, that's a pretty intense color down here. It's all relative to everything else on your palette, everything else in your painting. Let me uh, clean this brush a little bit and um, let's put some really pure pigment next to it just to compare. So here's two really pure pigments right next to um, this orange that we made. And this is a low intensity orange, but it is absolutely beautiful because it's made with those cadmium colors that are mixing with our homemade black, our, our just dark pigment that we made. Two other mixtures that you can use to make your own dark or homemade black would be cadmium red deep and Prussian blue. Those two together make a really good dark. Or a lizard and crimson and phthalo green. And you'll just have to mix those on your own and work with them a little bit and find out uh, which ones that you like and fit your paintings and your personality.